let's 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 thank Chris too for uh, for his new project here at uh, Jepson Ranch. And Josh, your place. Thank you very much for opening the doors for here. We're real excited about where where the project is going. So, Chris, thanks, sir. Thank you, bud. What is really fun seeing so many familiar faces and folks that uh, I've gotten to know quite a bit over the last couple years. Do you want to especially say thank you to Paul for coordinating these meetings? It's interesting because we have outgrown even the Orlando chapters of the Perpiculture in Florida, which is really exciting. So I, it's fun to be able to three times larger. Three times larger. It's it's amazing, you know. And it's neat being out here because there are so many farmers, so many people connected to the land, and there's a community community dynamic, I think, in Lake County that is very, very unique. Um, so thank you, Paul, for coordinating this and, and getting us all together in the same room. Also want to say thank you to Josh and Colleen, Caden and Colton, who are the uh, owners of the trust of the land. This is a family land conservation. Uh, CJ3 Farms is to basically help uh, maintain this land for years to come, where it's not going to be developed or sold or you know subdivided and that sort of thing. The goal is to really set up a model in Florida for how do we do farming in a way that cares for the environment and really cares for people on a very different different level. Uh, because the reality is Florida climate is different. Now I know everybody has the I'm unique complex, but I'm telling you, I've lived all over the stinking US. Florida is real unique. <laughs> Floridians are real unique, but the climate is even more unique. And so what others are doing in their zones very successfully, whether that's Joel Salatin or you know somebody in California or in Northern Michigan, those systems don't work real well in Florida. In fact, they've caused a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth in my own life because I tried to copy systems that were not for this area in this growing zone. And so what much of our goal is here is to be able to provide a place that you can come and see, come and learn, come and take it back with you for people that are doing it in Florida and want to do it in a way that is you know, true to our ethics and really true to our growing zone. Uh, also, if you want to look in the back real quick, the Howie Homestead people, if you guys can wave really fast, Becca and Matt for providing the snacks and the refreshments, and also Chris and Christy for helping set up and checking in. Um, and then last but not least, two more, uh, Randy from Growing Earthly is outside. So Randy will have a lot of the plants that we're going to talk about tonight available for sale outside. So if you are not familiar with them, you learn about them and you like and enjoy them and the plant talks to you, which, you know, totally happens. Uh, please feel free to see Randy outside. And then David from Ad Astra is doing our video. So this will be available to you online. So if I talk too fast, which I will, you can go back and re-listen to it and untangle the, the speed talk afterwards. If you do have your phones, if you could take those out real quick. Um, if you want to follow along with the slides and the notes, you can go to permaculturefx.com, click events, and you'll see the downloadable PDF in the bottom corner. Once you've downloaded that PDF, if you could also swipe up or bring down the menu on your phone and tap airplane mode or vibrate, that would be most helpful to the people that are around us today. Um, and I think that is all the housekeeping stuff. So as you're uh, downloading those, we will go ahead and get started. So as you're kind of downloading those notes, getting them opened on your phone, um, obviously the reason you showed up tonight is to learn about some indestructible plants that we can grow in food forests in Central Florida. The irony for me is the day that I posted this was the whole day that they passed the conceal and carry whatever you know stuff, and you would not believe, no, you probably would believe because we're in Florida, the comments that came back on it. So these are bulletproof, indestructible plants. I'm not <laughs> saying all these plants you can't kill because maybe you've got like the death thumb but all of these are the ones that have survived my cemetery of plants and I'll tell you the reason why I know a lot about plants is not because I'm perfect at growing them I've killed a lot of them so after you kill so many of them you learn the do's you learn the don'ts you learn what things that you should grow where you should plant them and it really begins to be a journey of learning from our mistakes I think one of my personal biggest mistakes when I first came to Florida is I wanted mangoes I knew nothing about growing in Florida. And so I went and got mangoes in December. 
Now I look back on that and just smile and nod at myself because I should have listened to my coworkers and not planted those in the month of December. But as the, the years have gone by, I've started to realize if we start slow and we plant things that we know are indestructible, that we can't kill, our dogs can't rip out of the ground, the goats aren't gonna totally destroy, we can start setting ourselves up for success and then building slowly from there. So for me, it comes down to the reality that it's not just about what I plant, but how I put it in the ground is also just as important. I remember five years ago, Paul used the phrase, which I've, I've used this nursery rhyme since, plant it high and it will fly, plant it low and it will grow slow. Now, for those of you that move from the Midwest, myself included, we plant things, you know, right even with the soil. Not really the case in Florida because things settle, you wanna give the roots some stimulation. So after I learned that nursery rhyme, I mean, it literally just changed my life. And so as time went on, I started going, you know what? There really is a way to plant something that is gonna bring forth the most amount of life. Now, if I did plant it wrong, is it eventually going to produce fruit? Yeah, probably. It is, it's gonna make you just stick in the ground, cover it with some compost and hope for the best. And it's gonna produce some fruit, but you can cut a lot of years off that time, the time frame if you just plant it right and, and do it from the first, the, the first step. Now, before we even get into the types of plants, I do have to talk about the trigger conversation because this is absolutely a trigger conversation in any permaculture gathering is the native debate. Is, is he going to suggest native varieties or non-native varieties? I don't know about you, I am not native to the United States. My people are not native to the United States of America. We came from Germany and from Portugal, and so I am not a native here. However, I have been able to find a way to live in harmony with my environment where I am not pushing out the native plants and making destruction and wreaking havoc on the land, but I'm able to work in symbiosis and in harmony. And the reality, I mean, I lived on the Native American reservation and native sanctuary, and so I'm very familiar with talking to the old medicine men and the old medicine woman. And some of the things that they brought up, I thought were interesting points in the native conversation. Because one of the things that they brought up was that our people have been trading seeds and plants for a millennia. Before you, you white people started recording history, we were trading seeds. We were trading plants. We were bringing animals up from other countries and other places and from South America. And so trading of those plants has happened for a millennia. And the reality is, even if that wasn't the case, over the last 50 years to 100 years, even the native plants of Florida have drastically changed. This last year, uh, two years ago now, I was talking with this uh, Seminole medicine woman, and she was talking about how their tribe had a very hard time for about, uh, about 50 years because at, in 1890, 1870 to 1890, the logging industry came through Florida and decimated most of the Florida pines that were here. The vast majority of Florida was not oak, which is very much a hot topic. There were oaks, a few and far between, but it was mostly pine. And it was very similar to like the Sahel region uh, in Central Africa. And so when you look at what Florida used to be, it's not the same anymore. Our habitat has massively changed, especially when we look at central Florida, which was so impacted by the citrus industry. When you look at these citrus groves that have been abandoned for 10 years, here's what's interesting. Some of those lanes where they were spraying are still barren. There's literally soil that's just in the lanes. The grass is growing in the lanes in between the trees, but where the trees are, it's soil. And here's what's interesting. It is not because of Roundup. It's because of the salt that was in the nitrogen fertilizers that salinated our soil, and so it's sterile. And so we, we've lived under this myth that, well, that's just, that's not native Florida. Well, those weren't the native way to plant citrus trees either, beloved, because the, the way that citrus trees grow in the wild, if you go to Central Asia, is they're an understory tree. 
They're usually dwarf trees underneath things that have high tannins, whether it's, you know, oaks in, in our scenario, but they grow as an understory. And so what we did in Florida is we started growing them in full sun where they were never meant to be in sterile sanding soil that they never grew in before. And then we tried treating that soil with salt to carry the nitrogen fertilizer and we shot ourselves in the foot. Uh, to be honest to God, the death of the citrus industry is probably one of the best things that's happened to the land of Florida in a long time. And that's really hard to say because we don't want to see businesses suffer. We want to see farms be able to win. We want to see agriculture really beginning to thrive. But as permaculturists, one of the things that I appreciate about this community is I don't want to just get my fruit at the expense of my soil. I want to build my soil and the biology of the land and build the, the native habitat as much as I possibly can because that is going to increase my yield over time. So are all of the plants that I'm going to talk about today native? No. However, I do think that there is a way to steward the land, which is all that we are anyway in our 70-year internship of life. We're here to steward the land the best that we can in the time that we're given and, and be able to put things in the ground that are going to thrive far after we're gone. And I do believe that these plants, especially when stewarded rightly, do have the ability to do that. So for those of you that are new to the food forest planting methodology, um, I want to just real quickly talk about five really easy ways that helped me save my sanity uh, when planting a food forest. Planting a food forest is not like planting an oak tree in the middle of your yard. Uh, it is not like planting a vegetable garden. Uh, and it's literally not like planting anything in the Midwest. Florida food forests are a little bit of a different ball game. Now, if during the talk, as a side note, if you do have questions, please write those down because we're going to do some Q&A on the microphone at the very end. Um, so how do you plant a food forestry system or an agroforestry system? So the major difference between agroforestry and food forestry, food forest, think wild, you're walking through the woods, everything that you see you can eat. Agroforestry is basically the same thing, but you squish it into rows so you can walk down the middle or bring a tractor down the middle. That's the easiest way that, that I can describe that. So when you start planting a food forest, I think number one is you gotta decide, do I want the wild look of the Shire, which yes, we want the wild look of the Shire, or do I want the Shire in nice little rows? Now, I'm one of those obsessive compulsive people that I have my closet organized by color and by season. Well, in Florida, there's only one season, so it's really just by color. Yeah, it's hot or hot, you know, and so I, I do like the agroforestry system because I think for most people on smaller acreage, I'm talking three acres or less, the rows make more sense. And on it, honestly, it's very rare to have a husband and a wife or a family and their neighbors that are all going to appreciate the wild, unkept look. I love that look. There is a place for that. I mean, I'm from Michigan. I hunt and I fish and I eat everything that I can possibly bring in from outside. You know, so I, I love the wild look. But I think in most suburban uh, homesteads, rural areas, HOAs, doing things in an agroforestry system makes it a little bit easier to install, easier to get along with your neighbors. And honestly, it's easier to maintain because you can get tractors down it or wheelbarrows or, you know, whatever. So a couple ways that I like to prep a site. Number one is grass removal and the basic soil prep. And there's a lot of ways to skin a cat or plant a fruit tree, whatever. So you can get rid of your grass a lot of ways. Most of the time I'd say just dig out the sod. But y'all, digging out sod in Florida, it's not fun. It's just not fun. So what I like to do is cut my losses and let the sun do its work. So I like to use the solarization method when I'm in a pinch. If I have a little bit more time, there's other methods that I prefer. Solarization, basically what you do is I get like the four mil plastic for painting from like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, roll that out on the grass, put some landscaping tape or, uh, staples in it and just walk away and let the sun just cook it. Now, if you use black, it's gonna cook it slower 
but preserve more microorganisms. If you use clear plastic, it's going to be faster, but you're going to cook a lot of microorganisms. Let's be really honest. If you were on an untouched land that had really good microbes in your soil, I probably wouldn't want to solarize because I want to retain as much of that as I can. The reality is if you live in an HOA or a suburban area, that sand and dirt has probably been bought in, chemically treated, fertilized, pesticide, all of the things. And the microbes that are in that soil are probably possible possibly not the ones that you want anyway. And with all of the good nematodes, it probably has all of the bad ones in it. So solarizing it in that scenario is probably a really good option. And it's a good option for people that don't have the physical or the time ability to physically remove the soil. So once you're done solarizing, I spray it with a probiotic spray or add mycorrhizal fungi or jadam or whatever microbe method that you use. And then I reboost that soil and reintroduce microbes on my own. Ideally, I don't have to do that. Ideally, everybody in this room has a chicken tractor that you can move the tractor down, let them eat the grass, and then you plant right behind them. That's the ideal world. But if you haven't had the gateway drug of chicken keeping yet, then you, you might be doing solarizing. So anyway, there's a lot of ways that you can prep the area, but I would say prep it with something. Number two, I like to use contractor paper instead of cardboard, uh, typically because cardboard uses a lot more glue. There's a lot of dye that is in cardboard. And honestly, the little gaps where you fold the cardboard, that dang grass always grows through those cracks and it drives me nuts. So to me, cardboard, it just gives me a headache. So I like contractor paper. It's the brown painting roll paper that you get from box stores. Comes in 150 foot rows. Guess how long most suburban backyards are? It works out great. So you just roll that stuff out. I like to do two layers thick and then I add my compost on top. And that's number three. Composting, I like to do about a 60-40 blend of mushroom compost with you know, some other type of compost, but honestly, good old black cow cow manure will work just fine. If you wanna make it into a mushroom or fungally dominated compost, the tip is to take a cup of flour, add it into your compost and let it sit for a week and it will become fungally dominated. Uh, number four, wood chips. This is the single most important thing that you can possibly do in any food forestry or gardening scenario. There's a great documentary called the Back to Eden uh, documentary, which talks a little bit about this type of a method. However, the wood chips in Florida does work differently than it would in upstate Washington where that documentary was made. Because our wood chips decompose so quickly, think of wood chipping like a, a Roth IRA. So you're making an investment, but you're putting it away for a while. So you don't get to touch that and get return on that investment for a little bit of time or a CD investment or something. And so what happens when we use the wood chips, it ties up the nutrients, nitrogen specifically, for a little while, and then it's gonna give it back with interest. So if you don't do compost underneath and you only do wood chips, your plants are gonna be yellow and anemic because they're starving for those nutrients as the wood chips are decomposing. Now after the first year, it's not gonna be an issue because you're gonna have built up that organic matter in the soil. So it's not, it's not really gonna be an issue after the first year, but initially, I start with six to eight inches deep of wood chips. I know that sounds ridiculous, but literally 18 months later and it's gonna be gone. Because if you haven't noticed, it's been a rainy summer, which has been awesome for the fields, by the way. The sun hemp, how great was that? You're like coming in and seeing the sun hemp. So the, the wood chips to me, if you're not gonna do anything else when you plant a tree, circle that, highlight it in pink. That is the one thing that you're gonna be doing is wood chips, wood chips, wood chips. Where do you get them from? Great question, thanks for asking. I like free, I just don't like to pay for stuff. If you go buy wood chips right now, it's about $700 for a dump truck on wood chips. They're gonna look real pretty. The reason why they look pretty is because they've all been ground to the perfect size chip and they're all typically bark. So you're not getting what's called ramified chips that are the sticks and the twigs and the leaves and different shapes. The reason why I like those ramified chips that you can get from any tree service company is they decompose at different speeds. 
And what that does is you get different microbes that will feed on the leaves than you will that feed on the sticks, that you will that will feed on the bark. So instead of one or two microbes or however many that are eating just the bark, those ramified chips are creating really diverse, rich biology in your soil. Uh, it's a, a really nerdy study, but it is well worth uh, diving into. I like to use websites like chipdrop.com. Uh, the downside in areas like Lake County, sometimes you can sign up and you have wood chips the next day. Sometimes it's six months later and you still don't have your dang wood chips. So here's what you do, and don't you dare talk to my people, is you just drive up to the driver and you say, I'll give you 50 bucks as soon as you're done to drop this off at my house, and I guarantee you they're going to do it. Well, I don't want to spend 50 bucks. Fine, go spend $700 at another company down the road, and then you can get your wood chips the same way. I'm going to spend 50 bucks and tip that driver, because then what happens is you get to know your driver. My driver's name is Jimmy, and he drives a pink truck. And so he just, you know, when he, I see him driving around, he'll call once a week or text and go, hey, you got room for wood chips? Bro, I always got room for wood chips. Mm -hmm. And the other day he pulled up and he was like, wow, this is a great new field. You want two or three more loads? And I was like, I kind of want to do a market garden. So I'm thinking like 30 loads. And he was like, bro, I got you. The best 50 bucks I ever spent. You know, so be generous. You know, let's not be cheapskates trying to get everything for free. Treat people well and they will treat you well. You know, it's, I don't want to always be on the receiving end of this stuff. So then the last but not least, number five, is finger test watering. I despise watering. I just don't want to do it. I think it is an absolute waste, especially using sprinkler systems, because the reality is you leave that on for an hour or two, you're only watering that deep anyway, and all the roots are feet down deep, and you're causing more harm than good by watering. If you're going to water, water for like five or six hours. My good friend's dad uh, used to run a sprinkler company or be a part of a sprinkler company. And he, and he was out in the field with us one day and was like, no, in Florida, if you water the average home for 10 hours, that's gonna give you one inch of water on 55 PSI, which is gonna go down one foot deep, which is the prime root zone. Now, granted, I'm summarizing for you like a three hour awesome conversation that I literally recorded because there's no way I could remember all this stuff. But if you're gonna water, water a long time and water it deep and then don't water for another week or two weeks or three weeks. I literally, if you wanna know my honest opinion, when I put in a food forest, if it's for me, for a client, for whoever, and I put in hundreds of food forests, if you do those steps and you wood chip correctly, I water the first week about every other day and then every day I take off a day, or every week I take off a day. So week two, I'm watering one day less. Week three, I'm watering one day less. Week four, I'm watering one day less. And then I'm done, Jack. I ain't watering anymore. Because if that tree needs that much help to survive, ain't nobody got time for that. I, I need trees that are going to be able to survive on their own. And the reality is you kind of want the trees to fend for themselves. You don't want them to be reliant on you. You want them to establish roots that are going down really, really deep. So the way you do the finger test, push your wood chips back, stick your finger in down to the big knuckle. If you don't want to put your finger in because you got your nails, which I have none, stick a chopstick in the ground or a toothpick or what's like checking your brownies, you know, when they're in the oven. And if your finger feels moisture, don't water. If it's dry, Wait for a day or two and then water. You know, if plants are turning crispy, all right, Jack, you gotta water. But if they're fainting a little bit, what that actually means is your plant is not dying. Your plant is conserving energy and putting energy into the roots so it goes to find its own water. So if your plants are weeping for a day, don't freak out. Don't water them. You, they could have moist soil and still be weeping. Let them go search for their own water. So those are the basics for me of how I like to put in a food forest system. Now, the reason why I want to do these bulletproof plants, and I'm going to go through these real fast. One is it's a confidence builder because Lord knows we've all killed a mango tree or we bought an avocado from a big box store and it was not cold hardy. Or we tried to grow the Haas avocado that we bought, not realizing that they don't produce fruit for more than eight or 10 years in Florida because they get prone to mildew and they just die anyway. So these plants that I'm going to talk about are literally... Like, if you kill them, come back and I'll congratulate you. But they're just, they're really indestructible plants. Two, these plants are going to be fast producing, which also means fast eating. I love the noble people that do permaculture because they just want to care for Mother Earth. I just want to eat. 
I just really love food. I like to eat well, and I love to eat often. And I know that sounds selfish, it's because it is. And so I do love caring for the earth, don't get me wrong, I'm not a total reprobate. But I love fast fruit, I love a good plentiful harvest, and I love sharing. Three, a lot of these plants are gonna be wind barriers and help create microclimates that are gonna protect those more sensitive plants. Four, they're very easy to propagate and share, which to me, is a beautiful reason to do permaculture, yeah. to connect, to share. The more connections that you have with the elements in your system, with your neighbors, with the neighbor's dog, with the neighbor's chickens, with the neighbor's donkeys. Anybody needs a donkey? We got them. They're 300 a piece or two for 500. Talk to me later. Number five, it also gives us a foundation to build on because here's the reality. If you are in this room right now, you have a hidden mad scientist in you. Some of you don't hide that mad scientist very well and your whole backyard is a mad scientist area. So I know I, I gotta have an area that's mad science. My neighbors don't always love that, you know, but I've gotta have an area that I can experiment. And when you plant these good bulletproof systems, it protects the mad scientist areas. It make, gives you the clean areas, and then you've got your area where you're testing out some crazy stuff, you're experimenting with plants that you have no idea what they are, or what variety it is, but Joe Schmo on the internet forum said it was really good and traded you seeds. Who knows even where that came from? So without further ado, let's get into these 10 plants um, that are some of my favorites for the uh, Florida food forest system. Number one, and I love doing the controversial ones first because I can see all of your faces, is bamboo. And I will say I am a huge fan of bamboo, and I will preface with clumping bamboos. There really is a massive difference between a clumping bamboo and a running bamboo. And so when I purchase bamboos, you want to know who you're getting it from, that they are reputable, and they are actually selling you the variety that, they are, that they're selling you. They're not selling you something they got from somebody else with tissue culture. Now, are there native bamboos? Yes, there are native bamboos. Uh, from pretty much Tennessee South, there are different types of native bamboos. The ones that I recommend are from similar climates as ours, but these are not necessarily native to Central Florida. Some of the reasons I love bamboo, number one, the combs are edible. They're absolutely fantastic. They taste like artichoke hearts. Any type of bamboo is edible and medicinal. The lucky bamboo you get at the Chinese uh, restaurant or store, that is not actually even bamboo. So let's not, don't even get on that soapbox. Any other variety of bamboo, the leaves are edible, they're medicinal, absolutely fantastic. The combs are like artichoke hearts. The leaves you can make as a tea, and it's the highest plant in silica and minerals. So it's silica, what silica does for us, it also does for our plants. S uh, silica helps deliver uh, minerals to the body. So when we take silica, it actually increases the absorption of vitamins, of minerals. It's excellent to take before collagen. So if you're doing collagen uh, or a protein replacement, it'll help your body better absorb the collagen levels. So think of silica as the party bus that just brings all the minerals in. So in the food forest, it does the same way. It's a fantastic mineral accumulator. Uh, the leaves are wonderful as a tea. You can do it as a hydrosol, and the combs are the other edible part. Now with livestock, this is absolute gold because for calves, for nursing mamas, for goats, for sheep, for animals that have rumens, they need massive amounts of minerals. How do I know this? Because every farmer is buying mineral blocks. Why are we not growing mineral blocks? Mineral blocks are basically vitamin E, selenium, manganese, silica, magnesium, and boron. Guess what's in bamboo? Bamboo, Me uh, Mexican sunflower, and moringa. There's a great study by the University of Baltimore at Maryland. They did in multiple locations in Central Africa because they can't grow grasses in the Sahel in the same way that we can. So they removed everything from their diet except for those three things, and they found that the cows were healthier. There was no change in the fat and the marbling of the animals, and they had healthier rumens uh, for digesting their food. And all they had was bamboo. Bamboo, Mexican sunflower, and moringa. So why in Central Florida we're still buying mineral blocks is a 
it's, I just I just don't understand it. And then number three, or sorry, number four, bamboo creates awesome microclimates. My three favorite varieties, number one is sea breeze. She, that's the one that's in the picture. She is so absolutely beautiful. That clump right there is 25 years old and has never been harvested. And it's literally only the size of this, this little corner at 25 years. So when I say clumping, there are true clumping varieties that are not gonna send out runners, like all of our biggest mistake, planting elderberry in our food forest. Anybody done that? Yeah, yeah, it's a back of the property experiment. Uh, the second one that's on there is called Graceful. So what I like about Seabreeze is she has very upright canes, very clean, almost a bluish silver kind of hue to Seabreeze. Graceful has a lot more leaves that are lower, uh, so it's a great hedging variety. So if you're trying to block a view, if you're trying to feed cattle, Graceful is really good. Also similar to Graceful but shorter uh, is Fern Leaf. Uh, is a really good one for cattle and for forage. And then my last but not least is Old Hamai, which is the really big building cane bamboo, gorgeous. It's not as dense of a clump, so this one is a very dense clump. Uh, Old Hamai has a little bit more space, but it's also not a runner. What I do like about Seabreeze and Old Hamai is a friend of mine we use the phrase now is you can't drive a truck through it. Literally, because they had a semi truck come off the highway to their front yard and literally the bamboo stopped the semi truck from going into their yard. So it is a wonderful, wonderful way to block noise, to block views, to provide forage, and it really will stay put and it's incredibly useful. So bamboo is number one. Number two, this is my addiction of the year. Every year I allow myself one healthy addiction because I don't want to get addicted to other unhealthy things. So my addiction this year was mulberries. So I have 17 mulberry varieties right now and I'm so nerdy, I have them in a spreadsheet with what zones they're hardy to, the flavor palette of the berries when I tasted them for the first time, you know, like all of the different information where they're located on the property, the height that they get, and then what breeding program that they came from. If you want it, you can email me later and I'll give you my spreadsheet. What I love about mulberries is it's, they're like the sweetest blackberry you've ever had in your life, but no seeds, so they don't get stuck in your teeth. And there are so many ridiculous varieties of mulberry. The flavor palette is absolutely massive. But for me, I love, I'm a bird nerd, I love watching songbirds. And to me, that's bug control for the pastures, that's bug control for my garden. I love just sitting and watching and feeding the songbirds. Uh, the Wild Birds Unlimited and I are like, we're like this. Um, and then secondly, the leaves are actually excellent forage and fodder for animals. Cows can eat them, horses can eat them, um, any animals can, eat, can pretty much eat them. Now chickens won't eat the leaves, but they love the berries. I mean, if you let your chickens run, they'll be perched up on the branches of the mulberry tree. And my favorite, I'm not going to impersonate this because, you know, ridiculous, of course I am, is they like get their little butt out and they do the like hop with their nose in the air to like try and get, I have so many dang videos of like watching those fat little mamas like trying to jump and like get the berries out of the tree. It is permaculture fun for hours. And then it's also a lot of fruiting during the year. Uh, there's a lot of different times that they fruit. <laughs> Dwarf everbearing mulberry seems to be the most popular right now and it does bear most of the year. When it starts to slow down, the key with mulberries, snip the tips and literally it will reforce their fruiting. And don't even like go around and cut everyone individually. Take the dang hedge trimmer and just right over the top and just trim it off. Use the cuttings for propagating if you want and it'll just restart that fruiting cycle. So some of my favorite varieties of the 17 that I have, Dwarf Thai Red, absolutely love it. It's about the size of the end of your finger. It's a little bit more sweet and tart, um, so it's not gonna be as blackberry flavored as the Dwarf Everbearing. A uh, little bit bigger berries, which I appreciate. The Dwarf Everbearing, if they're not watered well, can be a little bit small and mealy sometimes. Uh, Shah Reza is another one of my favorites. Um, so that gets a really nice, about inch and a half long black uh, berry. That one will fruit about twice a year. Dwarf 
Dwarf Thai Red, you're gonna get about five times a year on fruiting. Chiang Mai 60, uh, Chiang Mai is, uh, it's actually translates to the beautiful city, uh, and so, which I think is just so cool. So it's the beautiful city, um, and it was in the same breeding program as the Dwarf Thai Red. So very similar in flavor, a little bit bigger berry, and it's slightly sweeter than it is tart. And I think Randy has some really good looking ones out there. Uh, white. Mulberry is probably my favorite tasting. It tastes like vanilla cotton candy, y'all. It is like, it is sick good. The songbirds, unfortunately, they don't get to eat any of my white because I'm a fiend when it comes to the white. I'm out there like shaking the tree and you know trying to get every berry that I possibly can off the white. Absolutely fantastic. White is also a good one for grafting. If you wanna try grafting multiple varieties into one tree, white is a pretty good one to do that. Um, and then Pakistan is the biggest. It's a, you know three or four inches long. The downside with Pakistan is it's slightly more susceptible to root knot nematodes. So that one you do have to have a little bit better soil. You'll get a twice a year harvest, but those berries are massive. Uh, tip, do not plant them near your car. Otherwise it will look like World War III has like struck your yard. If you're interested in the more native varieties, uh, the Florida Black is a really good one. You're gonna get it for sure once a year, sometimes twice a year. And then the other Florida native is called Tice, T-I-C-E. That one was actually cultivated as a, a kind of a genetic defect from the native Florida black down in Fort Myers is where it was discovered. So Tice is my personal favorite because you're gonna get three to four times a year um, of fruiting on the Tice. The one downside with Tice is it has a more weeping habit. So it's more of like a weeping bush. So it's not gonna be a front of the property specimen. It's gonna be a little bit more wild uh, so that's our mulberry. Number three, this was my last year's addiction, because you only get one a year. Uh, loquats. <clears throat> loquats are a really interesting fruit. If you've not had them before, you've probably walked by them in your neighborhood. Uh, the, the texture of them is kind of like the texture of a plum. So it's got that juicy, slightly crunchy. Some of them, I mean, will drip down your beard if you have such a thing on your face. Um, but the flavor varieties are really unique. So the, what I like about loquats, I would grow them even if they didn't produce fruit. Number one, because the leaves make an incredible green tea, but there's no caffeine. So in the Tang Dynasty in China, loquat leaves, the young ones, were worth their weight in gold because they were so highly desired uh, by the royal families. So really wonderful green tea, better from the young leaves where they're still really fuzzy. When they're older and bigger, you can still drink the tea, but it's going to be very astringent. So your mouth is going to go dry. You'll want lots of honey in that one. Uh, the fruit flavors are so different. The sizes are so different. So Gold Nugget is one of my clients' favorite. We were on a hunt for a dang Gold Nugget tree. I kid you not, for the last two years. And finally, Randy got me a dang Gold Nugget tree. I mean, I'm talking, I thought this guy and his wife were going to cry. They were so excited. So Gold Nugget is like, if you were to take the best citrus you've ever had with the texture of a plum. And that's the gold nugget. Absolutely fantastic. Christmas is really yummy. It's like a citrusy spice, like an all spicy kind of flavor to it. Sherry is a little bit more mild. So it's gonna be like a very mild, non-acidic pineapple. Yehuda, I think it's kind of apple flavored. It's a very mild, um, very mild fruit. Um, and it doesn't have any fuzz on it at all. So it's an easier one for some people. Champagne is my personal favorite because if y'all met me before, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. So champagne literally tastes like a morning mimosa. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. So loquat, fantastic. Great for a tea, great for a fruit. Also, it's literally indestructible. It can grow all the way up into Georgia. So on our coldest winters, these are not going to bat an eye at all. I mean, I didn't even cover anything loquat related uh, during the frost and they were still fruiting uh, or flowering the next day. So really indestructible tree, very pretty. Um, in a more rural area, uh, you consider using these instead of a uh, magnolia tree because the shape and the leaf structure is uh, somewhat similar. Number four is Mexican sunflower. Uh, two major varieties of Mexican sunflower. So the diversifolia is the one that's pictured. So the yellow will actually get to be 
15, 17, 18 feet tall, I mean, just massively tall, stays in a nice clump, but it doesn't propagate from seed, it propagates from cuttings. Um, so that one is great if you're wanting this for chop and drop and using it for a lot of biomass. If you have cattle fences or horse fences that you want them to be able to eat. So if this is the horse fence right here and the horses are on the other side, plant your fence line stuff over here so they can lean over, they can snack on the forage, but they can't eat it all the way down to the ground and destroy it. So it's a, a great one for that purpose. The rotundifolia um, variety of it is better propagated from seed. I love this one in more naturalized areas. It's only gonna be about yay tall, three, four feet tall. Uh, butterflies love, love Mexican sunflower. The giant swallowtails, the big, big yellow and brown ones, just go bonkers over this thing. Um, so this is a great one, not only because it's great for cattle, but it's a nitrogen fixing plant. So it uses the process of nitrification to take atmospheric nitrogen, bring that down into the soil, and there's these little nodules on the roots that are basically hotels for good bacteria. And though their combination of those little nodules with the bacteria in your soil is actually fertilizing your soil. So to me, this one is a perennial way to grow your own fertilizer. And whether that's fertilizer for your cattle to be able to poop it out on pasture or it's fertilizer that you're chopping and dropping and not to mention the flowers are really pretty and that's important too. Number five, sweet almond. This is my favorite pollinator in the state of Florida. Um, so originally came from Indonesia. Uh, it was an incense bush there. The smell of these flowers, you can have an acre away and you will still smell them. And it's the most beautiful vanilla almond fragrance. And I'm talking, when you see this bush, when it's, when it's in bloom, which is pretty much all year, in the daytime, it looks like it's moving because of the honeybees, the butterflies, the pollinating insects. Now, I am deathly allergic to wasps and yellow jackets, and they don't go near this plant. And I have no idea why that is anecdotal evidence. So don't go put me on some forum for saying that. But I'm talking, this plant, pretty amazing. Now, if you're into beekeeping, the honey that's produced from this is out of this world. It actually has a vanilla almond flavor, and the honey is as dark as maple syrup. I mean, it is just absolutely beautiful. Now this tree, even though it is, you know, year round pollination, it's fragrance, it's cold hardy all the way up into Tennessee, which is great. It's really easily shaped. You can let it grow 17 or 20 feet tall. The one, the oldest one that we have is like three years old and it's like 17 feet tall. It'll probably keep going, but they get a little wild looking for me. So I do the hedge trimming. I love to keep them just hedged in. So a couple times a year, I go through and hedge them. They just stay a little bit cleaner, a little bit neater, but man, are they indestructible. And I'm really, I want to experiment with them a little more with their windbreak potential because they weren't phased in the frost. I mean, literally the next morning, they're still blooming the next morning after a 23 degree frost is what we had in our area. So that's, to me, is a really cool potential. The part that I don't know that if any of you know the answer, I'd love to learn is, is it cattle safe or friendly? We had one that was by a fence with a cattle and the cattle never touched it. I think it's because of the texture. It's a very rough, you know, kind of a leaf and maybe the smell. Um, so I don't know how cattle safe that is. So that would be something to research as well. But as far as pollination, you cannot kill this plant. I put these in the ground before and walked away, never watered, never mulched, nothing forgot about them. And they still look awesome and huge. So beautiful, beautiful plant. Number six, I just like the word, Patang tuba. So the yellow star cherry. So this is in the same family. You know the nasty red Suriname cherry? Yeah. The one that tastes like you're chewing on gasoline? I love it. You love it? That's, it's one of those plants that's a love-hate plant. So my, my friend's dad loves them because he grew up on them. It was by the lake lot that they had. The first time I tried it, I was like, this is terrible. It tastes like gasoline. And he was like, I love the flavor of gasoline. I'm just like, I just, I can't do it. But the yellow cousin is great. So the yellow cousin is more of a citrusy pineapple flavor. And I'm talking this year, mine were bigger than a golf ball. They were just freaking humongous and so good. Um, they're even good when they fall on the ground. Very cold hardy. They grow mostly true to seed. So they're not going to be exact because they will cross pollinate 
pollinate, but you can actually use this and graft branches of it into the nasty red Suriname cherry. So the nasty yellow or uh, red Suriname is the Eugenia unifolia, and that's a great grafting material. So anything that's in that same Eugenia family, so think of cherry of the Rio Grande or whatever, those can all be grafted. So yellow star cherry I love. I've grown this in full shade that gets like, okay, two hours of sunlight a day, and I've grown it in full sun. They both produced really well. The one that was in more shade took one more calendar year to produce, but that was pretty much it. Uh, some of the alternatives, Cherry the Rio Grande, that's gonna be about eh, the size of the end of your finger, kind of a strawberry plum uh, flavor to it. Very, very cold tolerant, down to 22 degrees. Um, and that one is a little bit slower to produce, like three to five years, really nice flavor. Really, really nice flavor. And then there's the black Suriname, which, it still tastes like turpentine, but it's like less turpentine. So if you like the red one, I would definitely give the black one a shot. And I will say this again, know your growers, because I bought three 15 gallon, let's not talk about pricing, three 15 gallon black Suriname cherries from a grower last year. They are not black. Wow. Yeah, we've all been there. We all been there. We think it's a good deal and then we kick ourselves. Number seven, one of my absolute favorites. Before I go on, I do want to do a couple giveaways real quick. Does anybody not own a mulberry? Does anybody not own a mulberry? Come on up and grab a mulberry. And I'm going to be honest, I just realized I didn't label this pot. So it says Chalk Anonymous Mango, but it's not Chalk Anonymous Mango. <laughs> pretty sure. But it's a mulberry. It's either dwarf tie red or ever varying. Anybody not have Mexican sunflower? This is the tall one, Christine. These are awesome from cuttings. Grow super easy from cuttings and really fast growing. And then this one is a longevity spinach. So I wanna talk about the tropical spinaches. These are some of my favorites. In Florida, you know, we don't garden in the summer. Our, our best gardening season is September to May. Come May, we're hibernating, y'all. That air conditioning is going up to 70 degrees, at least in my house it is, because I gotta have a comforter on at night. You know, it's, it's like I gotta yeah. still remember my cold blood. You know, but in the summer, we don't go outside much. The gardening, the annual vegetables, doesn't really happen, but tropical spinach is great for soups, for stews, for salads, and they are booming this time of year. So you can grow most of these year round. Um, so the one that's pictured is the South Sea Salad, also uh, Chief Kobos. The flower is edible, as are all members of the okra family. Uh, the flowers you can just put on a salad. You can eat it right off the plant if you want. The leaves of South Sea Salad, they kind of look like fingers or hands or pot leaves, however you want to look at that. I can tell a lot about you by how you answer that question. Um, so that one's a really good one for soups and stews. Chaya is another one. Uh, Randy does have one of the chaya out back, not to be confused with chia, where you get the seeds. Chaya, which I confuse them all the time, chaya leaves are really good as a sauteable uh, green. So think of it as a, a midsummer collard green. When you can't get your collards, you gotta cook it. You just have to cook it before you eat it. It does have small levels of hydrogen cyanide, which sounds terrible because of cyanide. But you know what? You gotta learn how to use your plants. At the end of the day, you can't eat a tomato leaf. That'll kill you too. You know, it's gonna make you horribly sick. So you just, you learn what parts you can eat and you can't eat. Chaya, the rule is you just cook it, just like you would with collards. Katuk, what's that? Variegated? Uh, you can, yep. Um, and then the next one is katuk. Uh, katuk grows great in the shade. So if you have a lot of shade problems, beautiful shade plant. The leaves have a nice nutty flavor. The berries are not sweet at all. They actually have the flavor and texture of pecans or a pecan if you're from a little bit further north. <laughs> so the, those are some of my favorites. Here's some pictures of some of the other ones. You can probably see them a little bit better in your notes. Longevity spinach is one of my favorites as a ground cover. Does anyone not have longevity? Or would like, oh, there's some cuttings over there. And those katuk grows really well from cuttings. Uh, that's a longevity, yep. So longevity spinach is one of my favorites. I use this in scrambled eggs almost daily. It's just yeah. easy to just cut up scrambled eggs, good to go, or in a quiche or something like that. Um, medicinally, it's really good at balancing LDL and DHL cholesterol. I am a master herbalist, so I can recommend things to you to put into your diet that may be beneficial to you. This is my disclaimer, but I would always check with your family care physician before adding something new into your diet. Amen, let's stand. Best of luck. So longevity spinach, really good for LDL 
LDL and DHL cholesterols. Also really good for stabilizing, not hiring or lowering, uh, lowering um, insulin levels. Upper right corner is another one of the South Sea salad. Used to be called Bailey's hibiscus, but now I think they've renamed it Auntie Lily's. Uh, the leaves on that one are variegated. They get about this big, like dinner plate size. I love to use these as a vegan wrapper option. Um, so I'll put like either, um, you know, just uh, dolma stuff in it or egg salad or tuna salad or you know whatever if you have to be gluten free and you can't have a tortilla shell really good option I um, mean honestly they just they're so big and pretty I've even just put one down on top of the plate and put my steak and potatoes and stuff on it just as a you know just because it looks cool it does get a flower the flower is edible as well the next one below it is Okinawa spinach, which is a cousin of the longevity. The primary difference, longevity grows as a, a sprawling ground cover. Okinawa is gonna grow more upright, and it has a purple underside that shows up a little better when it's grown in more shade, that's really rich in antioxidants and anthocyanins. So people that have a lot of need for antioxidants, cancer fighters, uh, polymyalgia, fibromyalgia, that's a great one to consider adding into the diet. On the next side is Suriname spinach. So this one kind of grows upright. This one does spread by seed. It's a great one to throw in a mixed salad. Uh, the flowers are really pretty. They're edible as well. They kind of flower all morning and early afternoon, and then they're kind of done by midday. The one on the bottom right is its cousin, the Jewels of Opar. Uh, that's kind of just a variegated version of it, and you get these little pearls that kind of hang off. Um, so it's a really fun one as well. Above it on the upper right is Brazilian spinach or sisu. He does have that outside um, as well. That one is my favorite for hamburgers or for vegan burgers because it's a really good lettuce that holds up the crunch even against the heat of the burger, which texture is really important to me. So I that one's my favorite. If I'm doing a burger, that's going on that. It's also a great one to add into salads. It can be a little bit viscous, so I'm not gonna make an entire salad out of that one as well. So if you want uh, the plants of these, those are some of them are outside. Also, if you're looking for seeds for many of these plants that are listed, go to Seed the Stars on Etsy, and they've got a lot of these that are listed. A lot of my own personal garden came from Seed the Stars on Etsy as well. Um, and there are, are you guys at the Claremont Farmer's Market yet? Not yet. Later on? Okay, maybe when it's cold. It is real hot. You got to be like, you're smarter than Randy. <laughs> So number eight, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes can be grown year round in Florida. When do you plant them? I don't care. Just put them in the ground. You grow them from slips. If you're lazy, go take a potato, throw it in the dirt and walk away. You know, sweet potatoes can be literally grown anytime during the year. The greens are edible and absolutely fantastic. The stems are too hard, but just pop those leaves off, put them in the pan, saute them, salt, pepper, garlic. A little bit more garlic, some butter, a little bit of white wine, and then, oh my gosh, so good. And Parmesan cheese, always Parmesan cheese, always Parmesan cheese. And none of that powdered junk either. Get the brick, darn nabbit. Um, third is it's great for cattle forage, uh, whether it's goats, uh, horses, cows, donkeys. Again, anybody need a donkey? Um, really good for cattle forage. What I really like about these is if you have the wire fences, not panels, if you grow it on Underneath of the fences, it's so thick. it's so thick. It's a smother crop, <laughs> Freudian slip. So it's a great smother crop. So you're not weed whacking. Some of you are still laughing. Don't even get me started. So you're not weed whacking underneath of the fence line. So one of my biggest pet peeves is having to weed whack under fences. Is it just it takes forever and you do want it to look nice so if you grow the sweet potatoes underneath some of you are still laughing stop it because i'm going to keep laughing so if you grow it under the fences it doesn't climb up so you're not going to put weight on the wires and it'll prevent you from having to weed underneath and then when the cattle come through and do their rotation they eat it all the way down and then you have a buffer crop if you want it if you don't want it it doesn't matter just let it regrow and you'll have sweet potatoes next year generally speaking I'm not responsible enough to remember what sweet potatoes I planted when. So what I typically do is I put a tag number seven 
on the sweet potato spot. And then I got my phone out and I go, hey Siri, remind me in 150 days to harvest number seven sweet potatoes, because that's how long it takes. And then I just let Siri remind me or whoever you have as your personal assistant. So that's what I do because I'm just completely irresponsible as I use the 150 days and I ask my pocket personal assistant to do that for me. Um, recommended varieties, hands down my favorite is the Tai Nung 64. Um, this one uh, came from Taiwan and this one about two years ago, I got my first cutting, mm, I think I got it from Angel and Brandon actually from here, and then I got another one from uh, Josh Jameson now at Cody Cove, and I'm talking out of any of the sweet potatoes that I grew, I'd get a bucket or two per plant. Tai Nung is like five buckets per plant every single time. I mean, I don't care what other variety, and I tried Stokes, I tried Okinawa Purple, which I really like because of the anthocyanins. I tried the Korean yams and the Jap Japanese ones. I mean, I was getting every sweet potato I could find, and Tai Nung blew them all away like crazy. So if you want cuttings of that, maybe next month I can put some of those on the table, and you can literally plant them whenever. And then, does Cody Cove have that on their website? Do you know? They do. Oh, yeah. They do? It has problems with rabbits. Problems with rabbits. They just need more. You have a lot as well. Awesome. So if you do need some more, maybe you can trade you for some cuttings because we're the trading people. Number nine, African potato mint. I know this is a weird one. Now, technically, you can eat the greens. I don't love the flavor of the greens because they're not greeny enough to be greens and they're not minty enough to be a mint. There's just other greens I would rather have. The thing that I like about these is that they are indestructible. They're gonna come back every single year and the tubers are about the size of a large water chestnut and the flavor is like a water chestnut meets a potato. So if you like sun chokes or Jerusalem artichokes, kind of similar in flavor to those. It's a great pollinator, so I would grow it just because it's a good pollinator, but the tubers on them are really nice. Now the first frost, this dude is toast, but that's when you harvest. So you let it frost, and the reality, you will never get them all out of the ground. So plant them where you want this to be forever because you're gonna miss one little tuber, and that's gonna be your plant that regrows for the next year. So that's a really fun one for me. Uh, it's not as common as I, as I kind of thought it was gonna be. And number 10 is passion vine. Uh, passion vine has a lot of wonderful medicinal uses, so the leaves can be dried or used fresh as a tea. It has the flavor of a green tea, but it has similar medicinal values as chamomile. So people that suffer from an insomnia, stress, anxiety, PTSD, any of the varieties except the non-native red variety, any of the other varieties can be used as the leaves, the flowers. You can add a flower in there if you want. You don't get as much medicinal value from the flower, but you could do that as well. The flowers, I just think, are absolutely beautiful on them. Um, the flavor of the fruits are going to vary quite a bit. Now, the native variety, the Passiflora incarnata, is real good. It's very tart, very seedy. Like, get ready to, like, crunch your teeth. If you've got fillings, bless your soul. Uh, purple possum is going to be a little bit more flavorful, but less seedy and a lot more nice and gooey. It's kind of like sour candy flavored snot, which is great. It's just awesome. <laughs> Awesome. And it's real good. One of my favorite ways to use it is I'll do the, you know, the black rice, the forbidden rice. I'll do black rice with a little bit of coconut milk on top with, and then sprinkle some of the uh, passion fruit on top of it. It will change your life. And then the third one on there is the grenadilla or the yellow passion flower uh, is a really nice one. Slightly less cold tolerant uh, than the other varieties, but still really nice. I did not cover mine this year. It did die back all the way to the ground. I thought it was gone. And then all of a sudden, there it comes, you know. So it is slightly less cold tolerant, but the other one's very cold tolerant, very medicinal, fruits high in vitamin C. Uh, and then as far as the livestock use, they will forage on those leaves all day long. Just like if you've got animals in pasture, they'll eat the Passiflora incarnata leaves all the time. They'll do the same thing with the other varieties. So really nice for that. And as a pollinator, it is the native source, the incarnata for the Gulf fritillary butterfly. And I do want to always be sensitive to our native insects. 
insects in the native habitat. So the Incarnata variety, if you are looking for that, Green Isle Gardens does carry that native variety as well, along with some other really fantastic um, native plants. So those are the 10. I did do one slide at the end that just kind of gives you the summary slide. So if you're going to screenshot something on your phone, that's a great, a great one to screenshot. Now I could go on for hours and hours. And, and honestly, there's probably eight people in here that know more varieties than I do at least um, that could add on to this list. But for me, these are the ones that have been most successful for me and the ones that I've had the least success in actually killing. So if you are just getting started in permaculture, Culture. Honestly, continue networking with the people that are in this room. The richest resource is probably the folks that are sitting next to you right now. Uh, it's the local farms, it's the local business owners, it's the people that you have next door that really want to grow, they really want to learn, they want to expand, they want themselves and their families and their animals to be healthy. If you do need help getting started, love to have that conversation with you. There's information about that on my website uh, as well.